get into uh, the message. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37 in the Old Testament. And this is titled in my Bible, which is the New King James Version. It's titled, The Dry Bones Live. And so tonight I want to come and I want to stir our hearts, if you know Jesus, around reaching the lost with the gospel. The God, the creator of the universe wants to use your life, every single person here, he wants to use your life in partnership with Him to reach people who do not know them, know Him, to see them come from being spiritually dead back to spiritually alive for all of eternity. And so I want to stir our faith tonight. I'm going to share a bunch of stories and uh, just of how God has used my life in unique ways. But it's just, I'm just a regular guy. I know I got introduced as a senior pastor. <laughs> I'm like, do I get a senior's card? Like what happens here at this deal of being a senior pastor? Um, but I just, you know, people say to me all the time, Locke, you're an evangelist, so you are, of course, going to go out and share the gospel and win the lost and see these stories happen. But I do want to remind us as the church that the role of the evangelist in Ephesians chapter 2 is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are in ministry. The church uh, building and property and function is just a portion of ministry. Every believer is in ministry. And I am convinced that you will not know the fullness of this life with Christ until you are stepping into this life of living on mission every single day. You know, it's one thing to come together as a church body and to sing these praises and this, these amazing songs to God. It's another thing to walk out those doors right now to Betty's Burgers and to tell the person behind the counter, do you know Jesus Christ loves you so much? I'm praying tonight that there is a boldness that comes over this church. For that word, that there is a revival spirit that's going to break out. It's not just going to break out in here. It's going to break out in this city. It's going to break out in this state. It's going to break out in this nation in Jesus' name. Before we get to Ezekiel 37, this is what the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says this about the church. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for His own possession. Is there anyone here who's thankful that there is a God who is that personal, that He wants to spend eternity with a people that are His? And that's, that's you, that includes you tonight. He wants to spend eternity with you. He's chosen you. He's called you. He's bestowed this royalty upon us, a people for His own possession, and here's why that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvellous light. The God of the universe has called a people for Himself out of the darkness of the kingdom of this world, which is the life of sin. And He's saved us by the blood of His Son on the cross and He's called us into this kingdom of eternal light, love and truth in His kingdom. This is good news, my friend. I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe it's your first time in church. You, I need you to hear this. There is a God who wants to pull you out of the grip of sin and He wants to bring you into the kingdom of love and truth, the kingdom of light. But every single person who has been pulled out, chosen, called, bestowed with that royalty is now called to proclaim the excellencies of Him. Friends, the purpose of the church is not about the church, it's about Jesus Christ. The reason why we are now walking in freedom is so we can tell the world there is a God who can set you free. And so I want to share these stories tonight to stir our faith that God wants to do it in your life just like He does it in my life. And most people would say, but as an evangelist, Locke, you have these amazing stories, but I'm an introvert. So I'm going to stay back and I'm going to pray for you as you go. But if you read through Scripture, there is nowhere in Scripture that God says, all the extroverts go and proclaim the gospel to all creation. He says to all people, I now want you to go into all nations and make disciples of those nations. So the role of the evangelist is to equip the church. And to be honest, I don't like titles that much because I honestly just believe I'm an Aussie bloke having a crack. That's all I am. 
I am someone who is in counted His love and now I'm just kind of sharing His love to the world. So we're going to read through an example of how God wants to partner and wants us to partner with Him. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 says this, The hand of the Lord... The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. I need us to see right now this is a very impossible situation that God is revealing to the prophet Ezekiel. In case you're new to church, a prophet in the Old Testament was someone that God chose as the mouthpiece for that nation. He literally put his spirit in him and he would speak to him and that prophet would repeat to the people. And here Ezekiel is seeing a picture that is very hopeless and very desperate. Verse 3, And then he, being God, said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Friends, I believe this is the same question that God is asking of the church in this nation right now. He's saying, my son or my daughter, do you believe that this nation can come to life in Christ? Do you believe that your family member can come to life in Jesus? Do you believe that your neighbour, your boss, your work colleague, whoever it is, can come to know Jesus? Do you believe it? Ezekiel answered, oh Lord God, you know. Verse four, and again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I believe someone tonight is going to get the breath of God placed in them and you're going to know that He is God. Verse 7, you got to watch this. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered over them, but there was no breath in them. Already such incredible miracles taking place in this vision. Verse nine, and he being God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God from the four winds, O breath, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Verse 10, so I prophesied as I was commanded and the breath came into them and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. I believe this story tonight is God wanting to speak to His church in this nation to ask us, Church of Australia, do we believe this nation can see a revival? Do we see this nation can come to life in Jesus' name? It blows my mind that God even wants to use your life. If I was God, I wouldn't use you, to be honest. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't use me. If you just got saved and came to faith in Him, I would bring you to heaven and you would live safely next to me in heaven. Or if you disobeyed me, I'd open up the earth and I would swallow you whole if you disobeyed me once. And everyone here is like, we are thankful that He is not God. But it blows my mind that God wants us to partner with Him. And you see this all throughout Scripture. You see this from the beginning of time, Adam and Eve in the garden, God places them there and says, I want you to have dominion. I want you to have rulership in the earth. I want you to uh, name the animals. I want you to partner with me and I want you to multiply and fill the earth. As you go through Scripture, you will see time and time again that God wants to use His people. Isaiah chapter 6, there's the prophet Isaiah. He has this throne room encounter where he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe fills the temple. And Isaiah is like, oh my gosh, is that who you really are? I'm asking that there would be a revelation in our lives of who he really is. Because once you have a revelation of who he really is, you will be serious about this relationship with him. And all of a sudden he's like, but I'm a sinner. An angel takes a coal from the the throne and he touches the lips of Isaiah which is representing Jesus on the cross, cleansing us of sin. And then Isaiah hears this spoken into the spirit realm by God Almighty. He says, 
Who will go for us? Whom shall we send? God is asking the question, who will partner with me in my mission on the earth? You see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, starts His earthly ministry and He walks up to a bunch of motley crew fishermen and He literally says, come and follow me and I will teach you how to become fishers of men. Come and partner with me and I will show you how to increase the kingdom of God on the earth. So God wants to use our lives. We see that time and time again. And He wants to use our lives to proclaim His excellencies to a world who does not know Him. And I want to say the goal for evangelism is this. It's to tell the world about Jesus. That's what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before He ascended into heaven. He said this in the NLT version. But you will receive power. Everyone say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses Doing what? Telling people about me everywhere. The goal of evangelism is not to tell people about the church, it's to tell people about Jesus. The church is a beautiful thing. This church is amazing. Bring people here. But the goal of evangelism is not just to bring them here. It's to show them the Saviour. It's to show them Jesus. And friends, I've learned in my years of following Jesus, the best way that I can serve humanity is not to try and save them, it's to serve them with the gospel. Paul says in in the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God under salvation. You cannot save a soul, I cannot save a soul, but when you partner with God and you speak the Word of God, the Spirit of God does something incredible. It's mind-blowing. This is what, Michael Koulianos, who's the pastor of Jesus Image Church in America, he says, the message of the missionary is not go, it's Jesus. The message of the great evangelist is not evangelize, it's Jesus. The triumphant message of revival is not revival, it's Jesus. The message of the prophet is not prophesy, it's Jesus. The message of the pastor is not how to build a big church, it's Jesus. He is the message. He is the reason you have received this power It's not just so you have goosebumps. It's so you can be a fiery witness of who Jesus Christ is. You are called into this prophetic partnership of being a partner in the kingdom of God to reach the world with the gospel. That word prophesy literally means this. It means to declare the mind of God over a person or a situation. God wants you to declare His mind and His heart over the world. What is the heart of God when it comes to the mission of God? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. The heart of God for humanity is that we will not perish in hell for eternity, but we will be saved in His kingdom for eternity. Or Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, The God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. This is God's heart for people. If you don't know Him tonight, I want you to hear this. This is God's heart for you. He wants to spend eternity with you. What an incredible God. It's just amazing. But there is something that is crippling the church. I believe the reason why we are not seeing revival in our nation is because the church isn't speaking Jesus to the lost. The church is not speaking Jesus to the world, but I feel like I've travelled here from the promised land of Tweed Heads to prophesy boldness over us once again. We will not be a church in this time in history that is silent, but we will proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvellous light. Check this out. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. This is amazingly good news. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thought that would get a celebration, but that's okay. We'll try that again. No, don't do it just for me. Don't do it for me. This is amazing news. For everyone. 
my wife and I have been foster parents for the last three years of a beautiful, precious little girl. And when we took her on, uh, the foster agency said, you will never be able to have interaction with her family because they're broken and they're dangerous. My wife, who's very prophetic, said, I don't know, babe. I think somewhere down the track, we're going to get a chance to share the gospel with her family. I said, well, I don't think so. We're not allowed to have these kind of interactions. A year into the process of having this little girl, we get called by the foster agency and they say, "Uh, your little girl's dad has stage four cancer. Would you come and visit at this house he's staying in? And we're like, of course. So we go and visit, get to meet him. He says, what do you do? I say, I'm a pastor. He's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. She couldn't be with anyone better. We leave that visit and uh, two months later we get a phone call and they say, uh, we don't know how long he's got left. Would you, would you bring his girl back one more time for a visit? And I'm like, of course. And the night before we went, this boldness honestly came over me. I'm sitting on my couch, I'm talking to my wife and it's like a cloak came over me and I said to my wife, I'm going to share the gospel with this man tomorrow. She's like, how are you going to do it? I'm like, I don't know. And so I got there. And as I'm sitting there thinking, he goes to me, can I give you a gift to give my little girl when she becomes of age if I'm not here? I'm like, of course. I said, can I have a conversation with you just one-on-one before we leave? He's like, yep. He's got oxygen in. He's, got, he's blown up and swollen. This hour visit goes like a second because I'm so nervous. And the worker who's there says, you've got six minutes left of this visit. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got to lead this man to Jesus in six minutes. So I said, do you mind if we have that conversation? We go down into his room and it was the darkest room, the darkest presence I've ever felt. Demonic pictures all over the wall, guns, all sorts of stuff, crazy movies playing death metal music. I was like, this is heavy. And as he sat down on the couch, I sat next to him and he handed me this chain and said, do you mind giving this to her? And I said, yes. And I said, I've got to ask you a question, my friend. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity when you pass away? He said, no. How do you know? He goes, when I, was, when I was little, my dad used to say, do you remember what life was like before you were born? And then he goes, that's what life's going to be like after you die. And I said, my friend, I'm here to tell you that you are going to spend eternity somewhere. It's either going to be with God in heaven or it's going to be in hell separated from him. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, you can be saved today. You can give your life to Jesus and you can spend eternity with him. These tears started to well up in his eyes and he says, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. I've been a bad person in life. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, this is the best news I'm about to tell you because it doesn't matter about what you've done. It actually matters about what Jesus Christ, the Son of God did on the cross. I said, the Bible says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can spend eternity with him right now. These tears start streaming down his face and he says, I want this Jesus. Right there and then I got to lead my little foster girl's biological dad to the Lord. And right now I believe he's in the great cloud of witnesses and he's saying, tell them, tell them, Locke, of what a great saviour he is. God wants to use your life. He wants to partner with you to reach people in the most unique circumstances. Paul goes on in Romans 10 and says, But how will they call on Him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You might hear that word right there and be like, I'm not a preacher. So glad I'm not a preacher. Because this is just for the preachers. Do you know that word preach and proclaim, which I read out in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, are the same word. You, my friend, are a preacher. You are called to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvellous light. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? We're going to pray a great commissioning over this service tonight and we're going to go out into the world. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Man, this is amazing. He wants to use our lives. Church, let's stop focusing on the wrong things. COVID came the last few years to distract us, to take our focus, to try and find the Antichrist. Is it under there? Is it Bill Gates? Who is the Antichrist? Let's stop focusing on the wrong things because there is a mission at hand. People are going to hell for eternity. While Christians are arguing about that kind of stuff, Ezekiel's over here prophesying to a valley of bones. Now that's weird. 
but he's seeing the miraculous take place. Why? Because he's speaking the Word of God. There is someone somewhere right now outside of these walls who is preaching the gospel to someone who doesn't know Jesus and they are seeing that person come from spiritual death into spiritual life. And I want to say when that happens in your life, in here is amazing, but when it happens in your life, in your workplace or at the cafe or at Betty Burgers after this, my goodness, you watch. You will never feel more on fire than you uh, are in that moment. And here's what I've learned. God doesn't flow through the most gifted. He doesn't flow through the most talented. Like I just passed school here. I just got through. So any teacher or anyone who knows me from that life who sees me now is like, God's real. I believe it. He's real. What I've learned, he doesn't flow through the most gifted or talented. He he flows through the most available. He's looking for a church who is available on the earth today. So a couple of points just as I come to a close. How do we live in this prophetic partnership? How do we partner with God in His mission to see people come from spiritual death to spiritual life. My first point is this, if you're taking notes, you've got to understand that the Holy Spirit is the master evangelist and He's setting you up. If you understand this revelation that God is drawing men unto Himself and you just are coming into alignment and partnership with Him, it'll take the weight right off. Because all of a sudden you'll realise, wow, God, He really set me up there. He's setting you up. That's how Ezekiel 37 starts. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out. This is the story of the gospel. It wasn't us coming to God going, God, desperate situation in our nation of Australia. We need you to move. No, the reason why you have a burning desire in you to see people come to Christ is because the Spirit of God has brought you from death to life. He has awakened your desires. The Spirit of God has brought you out. Why? Because He wants you now to proclaim his excellencies. A few years ago, I was traveling through America and I was checking out a whole bunch of different churches over there. And we were, it was a 12 day trip. And I think I did about seven different states and seven, like 10 different flights. It was crazy. But something I learned is there any Americans here? I love Americans. Um, one thing I did learn in America, though, is that they can't say my name, Lachlan. They just cannot say Lachlan. So every time I'd introduce myself, there would just be this stumbling moment and they didn't understand my name. And uh, I really learned that at Starbucks. When you order a Starbucks coffee and they're like, what name, sir? And I'm like, Lachlan. They're like, what? L- L- L-. And they come out with this name. I've got a photo that'll be on the screen right now. And this is uh, one of the cups that they've written my name on. I don't even know what it says. I still try to work it out. Is it Luca, Locker? But this would just happen time and time again. And so I was traveling into all these different states and then I was at um, Charlotte, North Carolina, about to fly to Seattle and I was exhausted. And I go, I better get a coffee. I walk up to the Starbucks and I just, they asked me what coffee and I said, uh, just a cappuccino, thanks. And they're like, what name? And I just, I just went silent and stared because I was having a conversation in my head and I said, well, what's the point? You're going to get it wrong or you're not going to understand it. And they're like, what name, sir? And I'm still not responding. And they're like, what name for the coffee? And I'm like, Todd. <laughs> yeah, all right, Todd. And he writes down Todd on the cup and I'm like, man, I'm exhausted. Why do I use that name? And I walk over and I wait where the coffees are coming out. And I'm just off in daydream land and I hear him saying, cappuccino for Todd, cappuccino for Todd. And I'm not responding because my name's not Todd. (laughs) And so I'm just like, "Eh," and he's looking at me like, cappuccino for Todd. And I'm like, that's me, I'm Todd, thank you. And I grab my coffee and I ended up taking a photo. You'll see it on the screen here. And I sent that to my wife and I'm like, I am so exhausted. This is what just happened. And she's like, have a sleep on the plane, please. And so as someone who has come alive to witnessing to people, I, an aeroplane's the perfect place to tell them about Jesus because where are they going to go? Like, what are they going to do? They're going to jump out the window? So you are like, that is a preordained moment. You're sitting next to that person. But because I was so tired, I fell asleep, like snoring, dribbling, the whole deal. And I had a dream that I missed an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus and I woke up in a panic. And I instantly woke up and, like, <laughs> and I lean across. I said, hey, what's your name? We get in this conversation. And uh, I just start saying, uh, I steer the conversation towards faith. 
If you're a believer, I encourage you, always steer that conversation towards, do you have a faith? And he says, no, I don't have a faith. I don't believe in God. He goes, I go to this little uniting church down the road every now and then because the old ladies there love me and make me scones. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and uh, he says, but I don't really believe there's something out there. He says, do you believe? And I said, I'm about to share my testimony and you are going to fall down on your knees and cry out to the Lord to save you. And I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I believe. I said, I grew up in a Christian school. I went to church, but it wasn't real for me hit my teenage years and I started to try everything, relationships, drugs, partying, the whole scene. And every single time I was empty and then some friends invited me to a conference in Sydney. And it was there that I met the King, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And He changed my life. And I'm passionately sharing this story. And He's like, looking back at me like this. And I'm like, Ed. And He's like, I'm so sorry. We've been talking for an hour and I haven't even asked you your name. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I said, oh, look, it's a bit of a long story, but my name's confusing in America. So how about you tell me your name first and then I'll tell you my name. And he's looking at me like, that is so weird. I said, just trust me, just tell me your name. He's like, yeah, whatever. My name's Todd. And in that moment, I was like, you are not serious. I'm like, your name is not Todd. And I'm starting to get really loud and excited. And he's like, what's going on right now? I'm like, you cannot be serious. Your name is Todd. He's like, my name's Todd. I'm like, it is not Todd. Prove it to me. And he pulls out his license and he shows me his name's Todd. I'm like, you are not going to believe this. I said, my name's Lachlan. He's like, what? And I said, don't worry about it. I said, because no one can understand my name in America at that last um, Starbucks in the airport there, I used the name Todd on my cup. He's like, no, you didn't. I'm like, oh, yes, I did. And I pull out my phone and I show him that photo and he's like, <gasps> and he looks at me and he's looking around. He's like, he sent you for me, didn't he? <laughs> now, because I've learned that I'm in a partnership with God, I just leant into that moment and I said, yes, he has, Todd. And I said, and I've traveled from Australia to find you. <laughs> In a moment, this man's heart and life was open. And he was so much more willing to listen about this Jesus. I want to tell you, my friend, there is a God who wants to use your life in the most unique ways. The most unique ways. He's incredible. Late last year, I was filling up petrol at the local BP servo near me. And as I was lining up to pay for my petrol, the guy at the counter, two people in front of me, was having this big old catch up with the person they knew who was working there. And I was getting really agitated. You know, when you don't have much time and you're like, this is so frustrating. I'm like, wanted to be like, get a room, like go catch up somewhere else. And there's about 20 people lining up at this point. I'm like, oh, this is so irritating. And then the Spirit of God speaks to me. And he says, if he can't pay for his fuel, will you pay for it? I was like, oh God, like, you know, like, you know, petrol prices are expensive today. It's like inflation and world economic crisis that's going to happen. And then all of a sudden this guy pulls out his card and he pays for his petrol and he walks off. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh no, maybe it's the girl in front of me. And she walks up and she's like, can I have a pack of Winnie Reds, please? So I'm like, it's not her because God clearly said petrol. And then I'm next. And so I pay for my petrol and I'm like, yes. And I walk off. And as I'm walking off, the girl from behind me runs forward and she's like, excuse me, do you mind if I use your phone? My phone's flat and I need to ring my mum to transfer some money so I can pay for petrol. Now, by that point, I'm like, la, 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 I can't hear anything. But because I'm learning that there is a God who wants to use my life to reach people in the most unique ways. She grabs the phone, she walks over to the side and all of a sudden I walk over, I said, hey, this might sound crazy, but I'm going to pay for your petrol today. And she's like, what? She's like, you can't do that. I'm like, yes, I can. So I walk over to the counter, I say to the worker, can I pay for this girl's petrol? Uh, can I prepay it because I've got to leave? And they said, no, you can't prepay it. She has to fill up first and then you've got to pay for it. Ah, God doesn't just want me to pay for petrol. He wants me to share the gospel. And so as we walk out, she's like, this is so amazing. I can't believe you do this. And I said, well, there's actually a reason why I'm doing this. You see, I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ has saved me. 
He's filled me with his love. I was once empty and angry and now I have this peace and this love and this purpose in my life. And I felt God say that I need to pay for someone's fuel. And she's like, are you serious? I'm like, I'm dead serious. And I said, and you jump forward right as I was about to leave. And I knew God wanted me to pay for your petrol because he wants me to let you know that he loves you so much. As I said that, these tears welled up in her eyes and started to stream down her face. She's like, I can't believe you're telling me this right now. She's like, my boyfriend just broke up with me and I'm considering taking my life. She goes, and I've just been at a meeting in Brisbane because I'm an actress and I'm about to be on a Netflix film that's going to go to 400 million people around the world, but no one would know how broken and hopeless my life is. And in that moment, I just knew, God, you are a God who wants to save. You are a God who wants to heal. You are a God who wants to deliver. And I just got to share the gospel with her in that moment at the BP petrol station. Not in a church service. There was no epic keyboard playing in the background, ushering in the spirit. It was in the middle of where they were filling up petrol. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you right now? And I'm laying my hand just saying, God, fill her right now with your love and your truth and your spirit. And she's like, this is the craziest thing that's ever. When you understand that He is the master evangelist and He is setting you up. You will step into these opportunities that'll blow your mind. I promise you, I promise you, this is not for some super Christian. This is for every believer who is filled with the Spirit of God. How do we live in prophetic partnership? We understand He's the master evangelist and He's setting me up. Second point, as the band comes, how do I live in this prophetic partnership? You've got to understand this. God wants to do the impossible through your life. He wants to do the impossible. I already know the voices that are speaking into your head right now as I'm preaching this message. Oh, mate, this is not for you. This is not for you. You you don't go out and do this kind of radical stuff. This is not for you. I want to say this. I silence every voice of the enemy right now in Jesus' name. This is for you. God wants to do the impossible through your life. And now what I've learned about the gospel, it is impossible for me to bring anyone from death to life. But Ephesians 2 says that we were all dead in our trespasses and sins, yet we were made alive together in Christ by the power of His Spirit that does a unique work in our life. And so I wanna ask you that question tonight, what would the impossible look like for you? What would it look like? Or maybe let me say it this way, Who would the impossible look like for you? Who would it be? Could be your spouse. You could be married here and your spouse doesn't know Jesus and you're like, man, I've tried for years, it's not worked. Could be your parents. Could be your siblings. Could be a work colleague or a friend or a neighbour. Who would that impossible person be? My parents uh, got divorced when I was 10 years old and my dad moved down to Kira. And uh, that's where I started surfing and I fell in love with that whole region. And I realised in that moment that I, as I became, sorry, as I became a Christian, I realised I had such a burning desire to see the surf community come to know Jesus. I wanted to see pro surfers come to know Jesus. He just gave me these visions of pro surfers coming to know the Lord. And I'm thinking, how could I ever have that opportunity? It's just little old me. In 2019, I remember sitting at my desk and I was writing a message and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, I want you to write a card to Joel Parkinson. Now, if you don't know who Joel Parkinson is, he's a world champion pro surfer. He's retired now, but there will be a photo up on the screen. This is Joel Parkinson here. And where I live in Tweed Heads, he lives just around the corner. I've seen him heaps when I'm riding around that area. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to write a card And I want you to tell him that he's an incredible father. And he's done an amazing job of loving his wife and his children while being in the spotlight of the world on the pro surfing tour. And instantly, I've got to tell you, my heart was like, boom, 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 boom. I'm like, am I seriously going to do this? And I just couldn't shake it. So I go and I grab a card and I just start to write, Dear Joel and Monica, that's his wife. My name's Lachlan, pastor in this local region and I just 
really feel like I've got to write you this card and tell you that God wants to honour you for being amazing parents and loving your children while being in the spotlight of the world. He also wants you to know how much He loves you and He died for you and He wants eternal life with you. And we gave, I gave him a pair of socks that we gave all the men in our church for Father's Day that said Raising Legends. And I said, these socks are just a reminder for you to keep doing a great job in Raising Legends. Might see you out in the surf one time. Talk soon. I fold up this card and I'm like, okay, I know where he lives. This is going to be stalker level 3000. <laughs> for me to go and drive to his house and I'm driving there being like, can't believe you're doing this. This is so crazy. You're going to get locked up. You are going to be in prison. And I get out and I'm like, there's no one around. And I quickly place the card and the socks in his letterbox and then I drive off. And I'm thinking, you have lost it. What is going on? But there was this voice that spoke to me about it. A week later, I'm in my office and I'm writing this card. Uh, sorry, I'm writing a message for the Sunday, the following day. And Ben on my staff sends me a voicemail that gets sent to the, uh, to the church, uh, vo- t- church phone, which went to our voicemail. And uh, I'll show you this. You can hear Joel Parkinson here. He gets a little bit emotional as he leaves this voicemail. Uh, Hi, Lachlan. How are you, mate? It's Joel Parkinson here. I'm just going to say thank you so much for your letter Um, and the socks too. I've actually just read the letter in front of my wife and kids and it was was very moving and I must say thank you. Um, Keep up the good work and I I guess I'll do the same as well. (laughs) Thank you. It was was quite, quite moving. I appreciate it, mate, and thank you so much. Bye. Now, I don't share that to be like, wow, look how good Locke is. I share that to say there is a God who wants you to partner with Him and He wants you to sow the seed. Now, I would have loved if at the end of that message, He was like, and I just want you to know I surrendered my life to Jesus. He appeared to me in my living room and now I am a follower. I'm coming to your church. But it's not my job to save people. It's my job to serve people. And the greatest way I can serve people is with the gospel. But here's what I didn't know. At that moment, I was sowing a seed into that surfing community. Because the next year, 2020, COVID happens, church buildings close. And in my church at the time was one of the surfing filmers, video filmers. And he sends me a message and he says, Hey, Locke, when a church service is opening back up, because I think Dingo wants to come. Now, Dingo, his name is Dean Morrison. His nickname is Dingo. There was three coolie kids who were famous on the world tour, Mick Fanning, Joel Parkinson, and Dean Morrison. He says, Dingo's in a really bad way, but I reckon he'd really benefit from a church service. And I replied straight away and I said, mate, do not wait for church services. I will go to him right now, wherever he is, if he is struggling. I said, send me his phone number. So he sends me his phone number. And all of a sudden, I was at a cafe the next day and I just text. I said, hey, Dingo, this is, my, this is who I am. I heard you're struggling. If you ever need someone to talk to, just let me know. I'm happy to catch up with you for a coffee. Get a reply in one second and it's like, I'll meet you anywhere in five minutes. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm about to have coffee with Dingo. This is wild. So I'm like, all right, see you soon. And then I'm like trying to get comfy and cool. I'm like trying to set up to be like, I'm about to have... <laughs> been looking at these pro surfers my whole life I'm like I know what I'm going to do I'm going to be friends with him and I'm going to build a friendship if I have to go on surf trips so be it I'll do that I'll carry that cross Lord and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say I have not set this meeting up just so you can be friends with him I've set this meeting up so you can tell him about me this boldness came over me the same boldness I'm prophesying over the church tonight and as he walked into that cafe he sat down I said tell me your story he was literally about to take his life and I looked him in the eye and I said Dingo I need you to know there is a God who loves you who created you on purpose and for a purpose no amount of money or fame or status can fill you you know that only God can fill the void And in that moment, we talked further. He didn't give his life to Jesus. But I said, if you ever need me, you can call me at any time. A week later, at 7 p.m. at night, Dingo's calling my phone. I pick it up and he says, mate, I need Jesus. My life is broken. I need Jesus. I got to lead him to Christ on that phone call. A couple of months later, I got to baptise him on the beach out in front of my house. 
I'm telling you, my friend, God wants to do the impossible in your life. It's not just about the famous person. It's about the person you encounter as soon as you walk out of these doors. This is the God of the universe who is calling a people to be His own possession and to reach the world with the Gospel. One of the greatest modern day evangelists who's come out of this church, Pastor Andy Goulet, absolute legend, going to go down in history, I think. Saving a generation by serving them and loving them with the, the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, but I feel like I've tried and I haven't seen any fruit. Well, I'm here to prophesy over you, my friend. Do not stop. Do not stop scattering. Do not stop sowing. Do not stop loving. Do not stop serving. Do not stop speaking. Do not stop proclaiming. Do not stop prophesying. Because you will see People come from death to life. That's what it says in verse 10 of Ezekiel 37. So I prophesied as I was commanded and breath came into them and they stood and lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. I would love for us to stand on our feet right now. And I'm gonna ask that the Spirit of God would pour out over this place. Come on, is there anyone who's hungry for more of Him? Anyone who's hungry for more of His Spirit? Come on, you've got to cry out. You've got to say, God, birth a revival in me. God. Just in this moment right now, I want to give an opportunity for anyone who would be in this room tonight and you would not know this Jesus personally. My friend, just as I've been preaching, there is a God who has positioned you right here, right now on purpose and for a purpose. And it's to hear the Gospel that He loves you and He came for you and He wants to rescue you out of a life of sin. You must hear me right now, friend. This is the most serious thing you will ever hear is the Gospel. That if we have sinned and missed the mark, that's what sin means, to miss the mark of God's holy standard. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. That's me, that's you, that's everyone in history. But the free gift of God is salvation through Jesus Christ. It's not about what you've done. It's about what He's done on the cross. He went to the cross, the Son of God, the perfect sinless sacrifice, went to that cross so that my sin and your sin could be paid for in full. You don't have to pay for it. But now you can receive the forgiveness of God and you can receive eternal life. And I wanna know tonight, if you could put the lights up just so I can see a little bit more. I wanna know tonight if you're here and you are still living in a life of sin, a life of separation from God. But tonight you're gonna say yes, and you're gonna become a child of God. If that's you right now, while Christians are praying for you, your heart might be beating. I remember this moment 19 years ago, but if it's you right now and you are saying, man, I feel like I've been lost my whole life, but tonight He's revealing His love to me. I just want you to raise your hand nice and high right now. All across this room, I see that hand, bro. That's incredible. Is there anyone else? Anyone else right now? You can hold it up, man. This is the greatest decision that you've ever made. Is there anyone else right now? And you're saying yes to Jesus. Anyone else right now? Come on, I know there's a war and there's a wrestle going on for your soul. Is there anyone else right now? And you're responding to that Gospel tonight, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bro, that is the greatest decision you can ever make is to say yes to Him. You are now brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. This is your family who is celebrating what's happening. Would you just close your eyes right now? We're just gonna pray and we're gonna ask that the Lord would just fill you right now with the power of His Spirit. So Lord, I just thank You for this decision tonight. Lord, that You have revealed Your Son, Jesus, the Saviour of the world to this precious person. God, I just ask that You would fill them right now, Lord. Fill them with Your power. Fill them with Your love. Lord, let them receive right now the, the sonship of what it means to be a child of God. Wash them clean of every sin. Lord, I thank You that they have an incredible future and destiny in You, in Jesus' mighty Name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.